Welcome back to Batman. And when Batman was Batman, Batman, Batman. BATMAN! What can you say about Batman? He's the favorite comic book superhero of a lot of people, including me. I just love the idea of a guy with no superpowers being able to do what he does. There have been many adaptations of Batman, but the one that many people feel to be the greatest is Batman the Animated Series. It not only says standard for cartoons based off comic books, it says standard for cartoons period. It broke away from the toy commercial cartoons of the 80s and focused on dark atmosphere, edgy storytelling, stunning animation, pitch perfect voice acting, and nail biting action scenes. It's a show that people still talk about to this day and many people have their own favorite episodes. Well, with this show being one of my favorite animated shows of all time, why don't I share my favorite episodes with you? Get your capes ready and rev up the Batmobile. Here are my top 12 favorite episodes of Batman the Animated Series. Number 12. The Clock King. A businessman named Temple Fugit, who's obsessed with keeping a daily schedule, is told by Mayor Tim Hill to cool down and ignore his schedule for one day. But this causes Temple to be late for a court date, and it ruins his business. So now, Temple has become the Clock King, who's focused on getting his revenge on Mayor Hill, and it's up to Batman to stop him. When it comes to Batman's rogues gallery, you have the maniacal ones, you have the strong ones, then you have... Seriously? However, the Clock King was originally created as a foe for Robin, and then he became a Green Arrow villain. He was a villain in the 60s show, but as with all of Batman's villains, he got a serious makeover with this show. What I love about this episode is the villain himself. He's not your typical Batman villain. You wouldn't even suspect him of being a villain. He's just a sophisticated man who just wants to revenge because he had a bad day. I also love how obsessed with time he is. He's so relatable because there are people like the Clock King out there. The kind of people who are obsessed with being on a schedule. And if they're late, they let you know about it. The Clock King is one of Batman's smartest villains, and Batman's mental limits are tested in this episode. I love it when Batman is caught up in a challenging scenario, because I love not knowing what he's going to do to get out of it. So, The Clock King is a unique episode of Batman that I love because it shows that anybody can be a villain, and some villains aren't always crazy nutjobs. Number 11. Robin's Reckoning Batman is hot on the trail of Tony Zuko, the man who caused the death of Robin's parents, but Batman doesn't want Robin involved. However, Robin ignores Batman's orders and goes after Tony, with years of rage built up on his mind. One of the millions of things this show did well was it turned Robin from an annoying sidekick to a serious character that is actually sympathetic. In this episode, we get to see flashbacks of Robin's past, like his parents dying, Bruce taking him in, and his first encounter with Batman. Yes, his parents actually died. We don't actually see them die, but the way it's filmed still gets the emotion across. Also, I love the episode's overall theme of revenge. Robin is so determined and really wants to go great lengths to get back at Zuko, which is why Batman is holding him back. If not under control, revenge can turn the most calm man into an uncontrollable killer. Finally, I just love seeing Batman and Robin's relationship. Sure, the relationship has been parodied more than once by the mainstream media. Batman's a pedophile! <laughs> Batman's a pedophile! Grow the truck up! The thought of Batman and Robin being gay lovers never once crossed my mind. I've always seen them as a father and son combo. They're similar in very ways. Both lost their parents at a young age, both wanted to get back to the guy who did that to them, and both believe in keeping justice and they themselves don't want the same thing happening to anybody else. They're the best combo since Pop-Tarts and yogurt. I have a very unique taste in food. So, Robin's Reckoning shows us that Robin is more than just a lame catchphrase generator. Number 10. Joker's Wild. A new casino is built that shares a theme of the Joker, and as you can imagine, the Joker takes it pretty well. And by pretty well, I mean he breaks out of Arkham and drives to the casino to blow it up and kill the owner. This is the perfect plot for the Joker. With how egotistical the Joker is, it's hilarious seeing his reaction to somebody making money off of his likeness, and you're just wanting to see what he's going to do about it. However, the Joker doesn't just drive to the casino to blow it up right away. 
He takes his time to have a little fun at the casino before he creates some destruction. I love this episode's subtle buildup, which is another great element of this show. It always knew how to pace the story perfectly, making each second that builds up to the climax just as exciting as the climax itself. My favorite scene in this episode is the scene where Joker pretends to be one of the blackjack dealers and Bruce Wayne plays a game and they have a conversation together. Each sentence they say to each other works perfectly for the characters as you don't know what they're going to say, but once they say something, you know that's something that character would say. It's a scene that an action scene between them can't do justice. Finally, Mr. Kaiser, the owner of the casino, turns out being as big a villain as the Joker, so it makes the Joker seem kind of like the hero in this episode. This show focused more on Batman's villains than it did on Batman. They should have just called it Batman's Villains, the animated series, but I'm getting off topic. Anyway, Joker's Wild is one of those episodes of this show that showed how hilariously entertaining and maniacally insane the Joker can be. One of them. Number 9. Harley and Ivy. The Joker is tired of Harley Quinn always screwing everything up, so he throws her out of his hideout and she sets off on her own. During a jewel heist, she meets up with, of all people, Poison Ivy, and they form a duo. A successful crime duo at that. And of course, the Joker doesn't take a liking to that. There are some ideas that you take a look at and say, What? <laughs> That'll never work. However, when you see that idea in motion, you put your foot in your mouth. Talk about an odd combo. Would you ever suspect Harley Quinn and Poison Ivy to team up? I know I wouldn't, but that's why their duo works so perfectly. Harley's quirkiness plays off of Ivy's calm and collected persona. They're kind of like a big sister little sister duo. In fact, this team up became so popular with fans that the crew members kept them as a team well into the new adventures of Batman. Um, yeah, I think I know why the fans liked their combo so much. Curse the blasted internet. Also, the episode is able to keep balanced out even when Batman and the Joker get involved in the story. It doesn't lose focus on what the main plot concerns. Anyway, when it comes to creativity, you have to be willing to take risks, because some risks usually pay off for the better. In the case of this episode, I say that this one is one of the lucky risks. Number 8. If you're so smart, why aren't you rich? Edward Nigma creates a computer game that makes millions of dollars for the company he works for, but he is fired by his boss who wants all the money for himself. Nigma then becomes the Riddler and kidnaps his boss, putting him inside of the life-size replica of the computer game Nigma created, and Batman and Robin have to use their smarts to make it through the maze alive. I love this episode so much that it depresses me. This episode makes me feel stupid. The riddles that the Riddler comes up with are so confusing that when Batman and Robin figure them out, I feel like a brain-dead moron. Oh, come on! I was the only cartoon character to graduate my high school! Not just because I was the only cartoon character that went to my high school! I swear, Batman and Robin are so smart, I actually want to be as smart as them. I had straight A's all throughout my senior year! IN HONORS CLASSES! Also, even though they make me feel like a drunk college student, I love the riddles of the Riddler. They're so clever that I'm just waiting for Batman to not get one right, but he always manages to figure them out. So, if you're so smart, why aren't you rich is an episode that I love so much because it makes me feel bad that the only Riddler riddles I can solve are the ones in Batman Forever. Oh my god, I'm an idiot. Number 7. Feet of Clay. A famous actor named Matt Hagen gets involved with a corrupt businessman named Roland Daggett and Hagen has to do dirty work for him. He ends up framing Bruce Wayne for the attempted murder of Lucius Fox, making Bruce a wanted man. Meanwhile, Hagen gets addicted to a face cream made by Daggett, and he ends up turning into the monstrous Clayface, who seeks revenge on Daggett, while Bruce has to prove his innocence and stop Clayface. Here's a tragic story for you. What's great about Batman's rogues gallery is it's full of sympathetic souls. They don't do evil for the heck of it, well, most of them. But they are just normal people whose lives are ruined by society, and they now have to pay society back for the wrong things it has done to them. This episode explores the tragedy of an actor whose career takes a nosedive into a bed of nails. It's not Hagen's fault he was turned into a giant clay monster. It just shows that sometimes the real villains in Batman are the corrupt jackasses who use common people as their guinea pigs. Also, I love how the story plays out. 
It has the perfect balance of suspense, drama, and of course, action. Plus, as a unique spin on the show's usual storytelling, it's rare when you see Bruce Wayne being on the opposite end of the law. That plot point makes Batman all the more aggressive, and he's determined to find out who framed Bruce Wayne. Batman freaking destroys a man's car with the Batwing and flies the man all over town, shouting at the man to give him information. Dang, Bats! Call me Downey! Then, there's the animation of Clayface. Good Tex Avery Almighty is this animation fun to look at. Clayface is constantly shape-shifting, and it's junk food to the eyes. Plus, he's voiced by Ron Perlman. You don't get much more awesome than that. So, Feet of Clay is one awesome two-parter that is one of the show's most famous episodes, and one of my favorites. Number 6. The Laughing Fish Joker creates a toxin that causes fish to have Joker's trademark smile, and he wants to copyright them. But, he can't copyright a natural resource, so he takes his frustration out on the men who wouldn't grant him his copyrights, and Batman has to stop him. The episode shows how hilarious Joker can be, as well as how psychotic he can be. When you think about it, this is an episode you would see the 60's Batman show doing, but it works perfectly for this show. This is the kind of scheme that Joker would have. It's absurd, but it's also deadly at the same time. And it's all a scheme to get money. The Joker likes to get what he wants however he wants it. And that's what makes him my favorite villain. Other villains would just rob a bank or commit insurance fraud, but the Joker taints fish so they form his sickening smile, and he tries his best to both sell the fish in quirky commercials and get the copyright money for them. I just love how the crew of this show was able to get such a suspenseful episode out of a wacky storyline. I'm sure the writers could write an episode about a mutated wallpaper that shoots lollipops at people and they would manage to make it dramatic and nail-biting. So, The Laughing Fish is an episode that makes me afraid to eat fish. Number 5. I Am The Knight Batman is late for a stakeout to arrest a criminal named the Jazz Man, and Commissioner Gordon ends up getting seriously hurt and is possibly going to die. Batman feels responsible, and he gives up crime fighting. Although this episode does seem out of character for Batman, I love how it plays out. Commissioner Gordon and Batman are really close, and Gordon collaborates with Batman on fighting crime. They're the perfect team. So, it makes sense for Batman to get a little traumatized by one of his friends getting hurt due to his irresponsibility. This episode just goes to show that even heroes screw up sometimes. We look up to them and want to be them, but they're just like us. As humans, we all make mistakes from time to time. Nobody is perfect. So, I do think it's kind of interesting to see Batman screw up once. JUST ONCE! I don't want this to become a habit for writers to play around with. This episode also shows that superheroes appreciate the work of the heroes we have, like police commissioners. Even heroes have people they look up to. That's why I love this episode so much. It's down to earth compared to all the other episodes. It doesn't concern a mental patient, a monster, or a bunch of children running around in the sewer. It concerns the little accidents that happen in life when it comes to the work that police officers do and how heroes themselves can always improve themselves. As the old saying goes, what does not kill you only makes you stronger. And in Batman's case, he became stronger after this episode. Number 4. Harley Quinnade Joker steals an atom bomb. That would be an entertaining episode as it is, but it gets better. So, Joker steals an atom bomb. That's so awesome. Sorry, fanboyism is acting up. So, Joker steals an atom bomb, and Batman needs to help track the Joker down. So, Batman seeks the help of, who else? The Joker's girlfriend, Harley Quinn. Honestly, how can this episode not be great? The story overview written on paper is itself entertaining. It's just so funny watching Harley and Batman play off of each other. You have a kooky female villain who's trying to help out a serious, down-to-earth hero. This episode brings the laughs. Oh, does it bring the laughs. Honestly, that's all I had to say about this one. Seeing Batman and Harley team up as the main reason this episode is so awesome. It's just something you don't see every day, and it's so unique that I love it just for that. I would love to talk more about it, but you just have to see it for yourselves. I can't do it justice. Number 3. House and Garden Several businessmen are being struck down by a toxin and Batman suspects Poison Ivy. However, Poison Ivy is dead and Pamela Izzy has gone straight, settled down, and started a family. 
Of course, this doesn't stop Batman from suspecting her. Towards the end of this show's third season, they started to have several episodes that featured some of Batman's villains reforming themselves, but this one is my favorite out of those kind of episodes. What I love is, even though I know in the back of my head that Poison Ivy is behind the crimes being committed, I start to second guess myself. She seems like she's really given up crime, and she's just trying to live a normal life with her family. Batman ends up being a bigger villain than Poison Ivy does. I just love how the plot plays out, as the suspense builds, and I'm just waiting to see how it's going to end. And boy, this has got to be one of the show's darkest episodes. Yeah, from a show with a consistent dark tone, that's saying something. I mean, Mike Jones. I don't want to spoil it, but... Woo, man! It's worthy of Twilight Zone. Poison Ivy might not be a Batman villain that many people take seriously. Thank you very much, Mr. Schumacher. But this episode shows that she deserves to be in the highest ranks of Batman's rogues gallery. She's just as psychotic as the Joker, and she's got the intelligence of the Riddler. She's one villainess you just don't want to truck with. If you ever step on a dandelion in front of her, oh boy, you're screwed. So, House and Garden. Dang, this episode is dark. Number two, read my lips. A crime gang is pulling off a series of successful crimes, and it's all thanks to the smarts of the gang leader, Scarface. No, not that Scarface, but a dummy whose right-hand man is the ventriloquist, and it's hard to tell who's pulling the strings in this relationship. I love this episode so much because of the villain. The ventriloquist is one of those villains that works so well. Arnold Wesker seems like a calm man who really isn't the kind of guy you would suspect to be a criminal. However, with him always carrying Scarface around and talking to him like a person, you can tell that something isn't right in his head. But, what makes him so unique is you have a hard time believing a Scarface it really is just a dummy. The way it plays out is, it looks like Scarface is the one using the ventriloquist as a dummy. It's the kind of psychosis that tampers with your head and makes you feel like you're crazy, which is a sign of great writing and directing. A real highlight of this episode is both the ventriloquist and Scarface are played by the same actor. That's right, I had a hard time believing that myself, but that works out perfectly for the character. Only a character that has dual personalities can be played by one actor in order to get the feel of the insanity in the mind of the ventriloquist. George Dzunzza, you are a man among men. Bottom line, Read My Lips is one of the best portrayals of multiple personality disorder that I've ever seen on TV or on any form of visual media for that matter. Number 1. Mad as a Hatter Jervis Tetch is a quiet scientist who discovers how to control minds, but he longs for more. He longs for somebody to love. He has a crush on a young co-worker named Alice who's going through tough times with her boyfriend, so Jervis sees this as an opportunity to seize her up. However, when Alice's boyfriend proposes to her, a flame ignites in Jervis that turns him into the Mad Hatter, a man who's going to do whatever it takes to get Alice back. Yes, this is my favorite episode of this show. Why? Well, love is a beautiful thing. Love is the foundation of life, and it is the main driving force of how biological creatures are able to create new generations to run the earth we live on, and the whole idea of spending the rest of your life with one person shows how powerful that emotion is. This is an example of love being used the wrong way. Love can turn the nicest man into the craziest psycho. It's not just love at this point, it's lust. Lust is now the driving force of that person, who will do whatever it takes to satisfy their own needs and not care about the person they seek. That's why this is my favorite episode. It shows the dangers of love if it's used improperly. It shows how it can torture a soul and turn him into a driving force of evil. This episode made the Mad Hatter my second favorite Batman villain. In his earliest comic appearances, he was a goofball in vain of the Joker, but in this show, he became a man who feels the highest level of happiness, but is soon crushed under the weight of somebody else's benefit. The Mad Hatter doesn't want to do bad, he just wants to have the only person he's ever had affection for. It's just a shame his motives are so... psychotic. I can't say anymore. I hope I'm not the only one who loves this episode, as it really deserves to be highly regarded as one of the show's best. It just goes to show, sometimes, love does more than hurt you. So, there are my top 12 favorite episodes of Batman the Animated Series. What are your favorites? I'm Ben T. Looney, and I'm signing out. I'm hungry for Pop-Tarts and yogurt.